All right, I guess we'll get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Priya Jumeira, and I run the tech incubator at The Nudge. Uh, welcome to, to this conversation on building a just and equitable country and specifically focusing on SDG 16 today. Uh, special thanks for joining us this late in the night at, in, if you're joining from India at the end of your work day. Um, and uh, we have our speakers on uh, on the line already. Um, okay, I guess we have we have enough participants to to get going. Um, human rights are a key in ensuring sustainable development, conflict, insecurity, weak institutions, and and less access to justice can wash away years of work in all other areas of development. Uh, as we started thinking about this session as part of the Skoll Foundation's UNGA virtual event, we quickly realized that in the COVID world, there is no better time to start a conversation on building a just and equitable society. And hence our choice in talking about SDG 16 today. SDG 16 that focuses on promotion of peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development. Uh, as a country, we are making some progress in that space, but as the numbers suggest, a lot more needs to happen. The ongoing pandemic has uh, split open uh, the inequalities in the society even more, making a stronger case for all of us to come together today and, and uh, use this as a way to start thinking about what a new normal could look like for our country. Uh, to make today's conversation more useful and interactive, uh, what we would like to do is understand who the attendees are. Um, so we will run a small poll right now to better understand the audience and that will also help us to fi fine tune the talk. So you would see uh, a list of potentially what are different roles that describe you best. And if you could, um, vote for it or you could to mention what you do, what role do you play in the ecosystem? That would be very helpful for us to understand who you are. Okay, all right, so I think super, we're getting the votes, we're almost 90% there. Um, so what I see from here, uh, there are lots, there are few people who work in the development so sector already, and there's few who are exploring working in the development sector. Uh, there are few folks who work in research organizations or provide legal services to the development center and largely a lot of people who play the role of an enabler into the sector. Okay, all right. Um, I think uh, we are good with this. Um, can, okay, we can remove this poll now. All right, okay. Um, so uh, thank you so much for your responses. So the agenda for today's session is that we, at B from the Nudge Foundation will present a landscape of the amazing work that is already happening in this space. And then we will bring in leaders from various parts of the ecosystem to talk about the role they are playing and how they see their work evolving in the future. Uh, what I'm going to present today is our first draft uh, of an attempt to map SDG 16 in India. We know that uh, uh, disclaimer that it requires a lot of work to be an inclusive list that covers all stakeholders in the ecosystem. Um, you can look at the current list on our website and we will post the link a little later today. Um, and if there are any organizations that are missing, please send us the details through the form that is there on the web link and we will update this landscape periodically and keep you informed as we do that. Um, the big reason why we wanted to build this landscape today was the hope that it can be used by 
uh, various set of people, ideators and innovators who are trying to find open spaces for innovation uh, by organizations that are already working in this space. And I see that there are a few of those today in this uh, conversation um, who can use this list to find collaborators in the space to scale their work. Uh, and by funders or uh, enablers of the ecosystem who can use this to find organizations to support. So, so here we go. Uh, we have divided uh, the landscape based on subsections defined by the UN so that it's easier to map out various organizations in the space. Uh, as you know, each of these subsections deal with a different aspect of SDG 16 example. For example, 16.1, that deals with the reduction of violence and related death, or 16.2, that works on abuse and exploitation of children, um, or 16.3, on justice for all, and so on. Uh, what we have also tried to do is we've tried to add a section on enablers that are working on this space, either government agencies, or research centers, or even others in this ecosystem who are working on enabling the entrepreneurs in the, uh, in the ecosystem. Um, given what you have seen uh, uh, in this, uh, in this um, uh, landscape that we have started to build out, uh, what would be helpful for us to understand as we dig deeper into this landscape and try to make it a little more inclusive and try to cover a large number of organizations, um, it would be helpful for us to understand uh, how you can use a landscape like this. And it will help us figure out the direction that we should take. So I have a second quick poll that I want to ask a couple of questions uh, on how do you think you can use this India-focused development landscape um, uh, to, and if you could give us your responses, it would be great for us to understand uh, what direction we could potentially take. And as we are getting the results, maybe we can also po uh, publish these results. Um, if someone from the team can publish that after the poll is done uh, to see where uh, people see a use for something like this. So I think the, the when I see this, I think result, uh, a large number have said that it could be useful to scout for relevant collaborative partnerships um, or scout for organizations um, or, scout, or understand solutions or interventions that are across this SDG. I think one of the answers is not clear in this, uh, but yeah, I think that uh, that seems like a, like a good uh, number. So Naman, if you could end the poll and just publish the results, that would be great, yeah. Okay, all right, can you stop sharing that in a minute? Okay, great, all right. Okay, uh, so right now this is a very static image, but we do want to develop this as an interactive landscape later on that can give you more information about each of these organizations. Um, you can help us by adding value to this uh, by um, sending us names of organizations that you think are relevant for this to be on this SDG landscape map. Uh, you could also send us th your thoughts in the chat box on how can we make this more useful, more usable for people? Uh, what are different areas? And we, maybe we can have a separate small discussion on this after, the, after we uh, go through the next part of the conversation. Yeah, all right. So that brings us to the next exciting part of the conversation. Uh, uh, today, I'm trying to see how do I move forward on this because the poll is blocking my way. Yeah, okay, all right. Um, so today, uh, the next exciting part of this conversation is for, um, for me uh, uh, was to have this conversation around building a just and equitable country, uh, specifically with people 
who have been working in this space for some time. Uh, and uh, and the, the three speakers that we had, uh, that we wanted to talk to today, was Ashif Sheikh from Jan Sahas, but unfortunately he's quite uh, ill today and he had to drop out at the last minute. And, uh, and I'm hoping that we'll have a chance to talk to him a later, at a later point in time sometime. But uh, we have the other two speakers with us. Um, uh, we have uh, Sachin Malhan, who's the co-founder of Agami, a nonprofit that is focused on ideas that can improve systems of law and justice that are stretched really thin in our country. And the other panelists that we have today is Shubhashish Bhadra. He's a principal at Omidyar Network and part of the team that works on digital identity. Uh, Omidya promotes the design and implementation of good ID that is inclusive and empowers citizens to access their rights. So we will start first start with uh, Sachin and um, I will let Sachin talk about where is the gap in the ecosystem today and give us some examples of how our organizations are in the space filling that gap today. Thank you, Priya. Just a quick check. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, absolutely. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I think that um, in law and justice, for a long time, there has been this paradigm of the state as being principally responsible, the state and its institutions, you know, the judiciary and, and uh, legal service authorities. Um, and of course, then the legal practitioners being critical role players in that, right? So that's been the prevailing understanding that these uh, stakeholders will ensure justice. And I think that hasn't worked. You know, <laughs> there's no polite way to put it that hasn't worked. Uh, you know, when you look at pretty much all the data points, you realize that there exist very vast underserved populations. Uh, the pace of justice is too slow. And this is despite probably the best efforts of a lot of people, right? And I think that, uh, what so so the gap is 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 massive you can't even call it a gap <laughs> you know <laughs> gap implies um so i think the way to look at it is to recognize the fact that possibly the most important stakeholders uh, which is the citizens the communities uh, these stakeholders have been relegated to being looked at as beneficiaries or the served the served with a d they haven't been looked at as role players or innovators and change makers, right? So the shift that has to happen, and, and this is not new in the sense that it, over the last decade it has been happening. There have been a number of pioneering organizations that have started recognizing the only way you can scale justice to 1.3 billion people is by equipping everyone in a very different way, not as beneficiaries, not even to play a role but to really be change makers, right? Uh, because very often it is people at the ground level who best understand their justice gap. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying everybody, but best understand their justice gaps, best understand the community knowledge and know how to work the system. Uh, and that's where you've got to build, build the strength. So at some level, you know, I think that this trend has been growing in other areas also, the trend of moving from the passive beneficiary to the change maker, uh, and what it looks like in practical reality is that, uh, and, and, and before I mention what it looks like, technology and data equip, enable that. Yeah. Because what happens is that when you talk about moving from a passive beneficiary to a change maker, today you can do that. Mm -hmm. Today you can, you can build coalitions of information. You can access informa uh, expertise that wasn't possible earlier. Um, and you can unlock resources you didn't even know you had you know so at some level i think the technology and data are enabling the shift from a passive ben potential beneficiary to a change maker and that is the shift we must all support at any cost mm. because that is building the real institution we always talk about our institutions collapsing the real institution is the human institution <laughs> you know so we have to invest in that institution and pretty much any other trend you look in fact, very easily you can see the powerful organizations using this lens, the ones that are empowering their stakeholders to be change makers, mostly by using low ground level innovation, technology, data, but that's it. 
empowering their stakeholders to be uh, innovators and change makers. So that's the that's the the gap is massive, uh, and we can talk about that. But really, the shift is, I think, the most powerful shift um, that I think uh, gives us a lens to understand what is happening. So uh, could you talk, uh, give a little background on what Agami does uh, yeah. for the audience and, yeah. um, and how are you enabling people who are thinking about this shift? So Agami um, builds on this realization. Uh, and there are many amazing organizations that have had this realization from the bottom up, right? And I think the first that comes to mind is Ashoka, right? Like globally, uh, Ashoka was one of the first organizations to say that there is a shift. The yeah. shift is let's not emphasize just the um, legendary social entrepreneurs, like the well people who built powerful nonprofits and powerful, uh, let's go to everybody. Hmm. And what they called everyone a change maker model, that shift that they went through. And that time it seemed a little crazy. In fact, they invented the word change maker. If you actually look at it, you yeah. go and realize. Um, but the powerful thing is that we, we're building on that because hmm. we, rec you know, uh, Agami recognizes the most powerful force is this virus uh, of change making, right? The more people see other people making change, the more they actually experiment with something at an early stage, the more it becomes a lasting social capacity. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, our goal at Agami is how do we maximize innovation and change making in law and justice? It's as simple as that. Uh, sometimes it throws people off because they look at it and go, but, but aren't you trying to fix the courts? Aren't you trying to fix this? Yes, but where is the underlying capacity gap? The underlying capacity gap is the fact that people see themselves as fate to comply. I mm. shall, this is going to happen to me. Mm. On the other hand, if we were to maximize innovators and change makers in law and justice by pointing to who's already doing amazing work and strengthening that collective uh, hand, we will inspire more and more and more to innovate and make change. And that will ultimately tip the scales towards the citizen institution as we've been talking about Priya. So I think what Agami tries to do is fundamentally that how we try to do it is, um, you know, three things I could mention. One is we want to uh, ensure that a different story is told because the story that you hear about, uh, you know, everything that concerns SDG 16, law and justice stories, it's broken, it's slow, it's corrupt, it's not working, it's dark days. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, you don't hear the story uh, of somebody sitting there ensuring all judgments ever of Supreme Court, high courts are a freely available on a platform. You don't hear the story of the young 20 year old who's building a system by which you can get feedback on new policies uh, mm -hmm. from, from, you don't hear the story of uh, um, Jan Sahas, I wish Asif, Asif was here. You don't hear the story of two young graduates of the law schools who are working with tribal leaders in MP to make sure that they can use their government entitlements and their understanding of law to become uh, reliant where it comes to law and justice. You don't hear these stories and what we, or the, the, you miss the big story. The big story is that uh, yin yang, right? Like these are maybe we may have huge concerns about the fate of our justice institutions and they may be legitimate or not. We don't have to get into that, but we often underestimate the, the yang, which is there's a rising tide of innovative, creative approaches that weren't seen earlier. So we want to tell that story. That's, that's the, the first thing. The second is we want to build a community because at the end of the day, it's a movement, right? How can you build a community of people who have that mindset, the yes, we can mindset to <laughs> paraphrase, right? Like, and these people and, and get away these, get away from these boxes of I'm inside development or I'm inside business or I'm inside government. Look, if you're, a, if you have that, yes, we can mindset, you could be anywhere. And how do we knit that together? And the third is developing the collaborative uh, muscle, how to work together in these problems. You saw it with COVID. How is a single organization supposed to be able to address them? Yeah. You can't unless and until you develop a collective action muscle, a collaborative muscle. So how do you do it? How do you take on big challenges like the inadequate resolution of disputes yeah. without developing a collaborative collective muscle? You know, it's, it's entrepreneurship is remarkable, but sometimes it can be a little isolating also. Yeah. So I think yeah. these things are the goal of Agami and pretty much everything we do is 
really building on the uh, on the strength of these change making ideas these young change makers that are out there thank you for that sachin and i will ask you a follow on question with this but let me first go to shubhashish um, so uh, shubhashish uh, we have all heard of these stories of how worldwide one in four children under the age of 5 are never officially recorded which means that they don't have any legal identity that means they have access to no social service no justice and in most cases in a lot of cases no means of sustenance as well um so an inclusive id can bring equity utility and security and there has been a lot of conversation around aadhar which is one of the biggest of such uh, id projects um and so what i want you to talk about is uh, what is the urgency of giving this legal identity to everybody and what is required to design a system that benefits and protects everyone and a lot of work has been done in the good id project so if you could specifically talk about that that would be great as well thank you for that question priya um let me start by stating what our position is we believe that everyone must have an identity if they want it <laughs> uh, and i think this this second element of if they want it is very important for us uh, because we believe that good id should have five elements it should be privacy protecting it should be inclusive uh, it should have user control it should be secure from uh, lots of cyber threats and that it should be well governed and that people should therefore have recourse um for us anything that meets all five criteria is good id uh, and we also understand that you know it is a high bar uh, yeah. and therefore what we advocate is every I, we understand that ids will probably not be there today and they must move in that direction um i should also inform you that uh, this whole notion of what is legal identity and is digital identity legal identity or not is a very contested question in international and academic circles mm. uh, but i'll side step that argument for a while and i must say that i a lot of my time i spend in working uh, on international issues in different countries especially in africa uh, and what i do gather is in many ways uh, what m pesa was to mobile payments aadhar is to digital identity so everyone looks up to aadhar wants to understand the aadhar story and many african countries you speak to them and they some people in government would say look i want aadhar for my country uh, but they also need to at the same time understand uh, what went behind it and what were some of the challenges that were faced um, in that context what i would say is that as we think about aadhar aadhar is only one tool of digitization right what we are having behind uh, all of that is that there is a massive uh, digitization and automation taking place in our institutions so the way we deliver services uh, the way we uh, deliver justice uh, the way we communicate with each other everything is getting transformed in a very fundamental way um, and aadhar is one tool of within that and digital identity is that's one tool but at the end of the day i think the question we have to ask ourselves is that in a world where institutions are digitizing uh, what are the things that we need to watch out for uh, and in that context what i would say is that um one way to think about things is that digitization is something that inherently and digital id is something that inherently increases state capacity to do many good things uh so it helps you deduplicate your beneficiaries and be able to be more efficient around giving uh these some of the rations and all these benefits uh it helps you identify people etc uh but at the same time like any piece of technology uh it is dual use uh, let's remember that uh, donald uh, donald trump misused uh, the very same uh, id system that barack obama had created to help migrants right so yes. the same thing that was good for someone is something that someone can use for bad and therefore uh, any society must place those kind of safeguards on its institutions either public or private uh, and i don't think it as uh, i would like to reemphasize that it's not just public institutions that we need to care about even private institutions especially in a world like today have got a lot of power because of the data that's at their disposal uh, mm -hmm. and therefore Uh, i think the three important things for all of us to care about is firstly how do we ensure that we don't give in too much to the law and the discourse around averages and what i mean by that is uh, when we funded the state of aadhar report and the state of aadhar survey which is the largest household survey on aadhar uh, while they did find that 99% plus of adults outside of the northeast have aadhar and that i think is commendable by any stretch of the word 
but there are 30% people who are homeless who don't have Aadhaar. There are 27% people who are third gender who don't have Aadhaar. Right? And if you look at the 99% number, you obviously ignore some of these, but it's very important that we look for the people who are the most vulnerable in society and say what impact is digitization and digital ID having on them. So that's one. Uh, point number two is how much control do users have on, on their digital identity and where they need to use it? So you asked a question about, hey, is digital identity uh, the, you know, the path to get access to services? But I would flip the question and ask, why does it need to be? Right. So, for example, if we did have universal education, which we do, do you really need to check for digital identity or any kind of identity before people get access to education? Right. So I think digital identity is important. It has its certain use cases, but we have to do it in a way that is least intrusive in people's lives and in a way that it's not mandatory for people, but people have the choice to use it. And the mandatory uses are limited to very, very specific and very, very narrow use cases. And the third and final element that I would say is that we need to think about what are the safeguards that people have. So if something goes wrong, for example, in your Aadhaar or something goes wrong with any digitized system, you don't get your ration, etc. Who do you go to? Is justice or is recourse something that's easily accessible? And what makes sure that you can hold either you or someone else is holding uh, institutions to account. So are we sure that there are enough institutional safeguards around some of the big tech platforms? Are we sure there's enough institutional safeguards and checks on some of the government platforms? So all of that discussion, I would wrap up by saying that um, I think Sachin spoke very well about how individuals can be change makers. And I think what I would add to that is that we need to ensure that institutions, both public and private, enable individuals to be change makers. So I think, again, that's the yin and yang. I think we need both to happen at the same time. Got it. Thank you so much, Shubhashish. So I'll go back to Sachin. And um, Sachin, you talked about uh, different ways that people can be change makers and that I love this idea of uh, why do we need to think of people as beneficiary and not as, uh, and how can we think of them as role players? Um, so are there any examples that you can talk about of organizations that have been working on, specifically in law and justice, it seems like such a government controlled area, which where a general public cannot play much role. So if you can talk about some examples, that would be amazing. Yeah, I think there are, this is becoming uh, more and more uh, prevalent now as we are realizing that um, the most scalable way to ensure access to justice is make sure that people can be justice change makers, right? Whether you look at it from the point of view of say the dispute resolution movement, right? Which is what is happening is that people are realizing that, um, you know what, I can maybe learn how to be a mediator and mediate uh, disputes, right? So for instance, uh, uh, in a, when you look at uh, various organizations like Ajiveka Bureau, or you look at even the Center for Advanced Mediation Practice in uh, Bangalore, uh, these are people who've gone out there and developed mediation capacity and they don't see mediation capacity as being something that is limited to you have to be a lawyer to be a mediator. I think that's a very misleading thing. We deliver mediation, the ability to listen to two sides and help to come to an answer. Whatever be the issue, property dispute, family dispute, commercial dispute, develop that as a societal capacity, right? So you see that kind of work where people are training uh, uh, people to be mediators and case managers and dispute handlers. Ajivika is doing it. Even I know Ashif by his organization, Jansa has, does it in a big way. You see the use of paralegals uh, where uh, increasingly you're recognizing that you don't need to have someone be a law graduate to provide every level of, level of support. You can have many instances of diagnostic support, uh, intermediate support that is provided by, and you see organizations like Namati, um, CSJ in, in, uh, in Ahmedabad, um, and Again, many people are now using the paralegal method to say that, in fact, uh, even um, Zenith uh, is another organization in Madhya Pradesh, which is using sort of quasi legally trained people to support communities. So you are seeing uh, these patterns, uh, even if we extend it further, we start to look at it from another way, which is used. Uh, and in fact, another organization I must mention, Hak Darshak, uh, has been using, uh, you know, uh, women on the ground 
in a very interesting way to kind of ensure that people have access to their government entitlements. So I think that what you start to realize is that at every level, there is the capacity to start to empower many more people as justice change makers. And you're seeing this, and this is not the idea that only for one type of thing. I mentioned to you, um, you know, first level legal services, mediation of disputes, uh, access to government entitlements. IDI does it for um, uh, for accessing uh, potential law students from underrepresented communities, where then those same uh, uh, students become champions or and run chapters in their parts of the world to ensure that they can find more such high potential students who could go to law school. So you are seeing this consistently, uh, Priya. And I think the layer that is getting added on uh, is unlocking the power of technology and data, right? Like, um, for in, and I'll give you two instances where, you know, where you, for instance, the use of community data, right, where people actually can pull together and understand what's happening in that area. How do they, what is the reality of domestic violence in that area? What is the reality of property disputes in that area? How have they been so? There's a lot of community data that can only, that, that is essential to point out what the solution needs to be without, in fact, public data actually sometimes can't help in those situations. Mm. So I think that you're going to start to see this uh, change maker empowerment combined with appropriate technology combined with community data and you're going to see a range of models all leveraging these in some way uh, you know that list is a long list of uh, ideas that are all leaning on the collective unlocking data using technology you know, uh, and one there's one example which I really love globally, uh, which I think people are familiar now. It's a project called uh, Project Echo. It was started in health in the healthcare space. Very simple idea, saying, "Hey, you know what? You have a health problem, a critical health problem. You need expert advice. Why do you need to travel 250 miles to come to a city? Why can't every university be a hub?" Um, for expert health healthcare, where the doctors sit there, then through Zoom or whatever platform, they listen to the, the rural area doctors, bring that case, they impart capacity building by training that doctor and they hear that case, became, became like a hub and spoke model, which is now an act, it's actually a law in the US that pushes Project Echo. So I think that those that sort of network, coalition, technology, data approach is going to be more and more common. Uh, another uh, very interesting idea that I can share, one last thing I'll share is how a group of law schools are coming together and pooling uh, uh, technology and human capacity to look at how the NRC exclusions can receive legal support. Mm -hmm. um, so again, very interesting models, you know, not your typical isolated local model, but like national models that are starting to left unlock uh, uh, resources in a way that wasn't possible earlier. So we, I think this will be a pattern that we're going to continue to see. And if we push, keep investing in it, we'll see more and more innovative models come through. Thanks. So Shubhashish had talked about one um, very interesting area that they are focusing on, which is around uh, empowering the regulatory system and, and bolstering it. So, Shubhashish, do you want to talk a little bit about Omidyar's work there? Sure, happy to do so. Um, our entry point into the regulatory discussion is because uh, we work on data privacy and in the data privacy space, the uh, big question mark is the data protection authority that will yeah. be set up in a few years. Right? And it's going to be an extremely powerful regulator and with a very wide mandate and also therefore a, a lot of responsibility. And that got us thinking about the nature of regulators itself. Now, if you think of how parliamentary democracies work, that uh, laws are made by parliament and they are the representatives of the people, but sometimes they create laws in a way to create regulators such that you get external expertise, you get independence, etc. But then with that great power should come great responsibility. And how do you uh, leverage that responsibility in the best way is uh, a question mark. And I think... Um, India's performance on regulation has been somewhat mixed. Uh, mm -hmm. That if you look at regulators doing public consultations, which you would imagine should happen uh, in any democratic society, uh, some of our best regulators probably put 50 to 60% of their new laws and regulation up for public consultation. Uh, but then there are others, including some really large ones, which probably do one or 2%. Uh, and I think that's just one statistic. 
uh, which shows what the quality of uh, regulation is. Uh, and it's somewhat, it's a mixed picture. Uh, and similarly, if you look at some of the regulators whose regulations or whose judgments then get challenged at an appellate authority, uh, you see nearly half of them uh, get overturned. So you're probably better off tossing a coin than even going through the process in the first place. Um, so these are some of the questions that come up and in our area of work become extremely critical because data privacy, digital identity are extremely complex issues. Yeah. And there's no, you, we also don't understand these things today. And there's going to be a lot of ambiguity. And on top of that, when you have a regulator that comes into that space, uh, you need to really think hard about how do you build the right regulatory practices around it. Uh, so to do that, what we have done, for example, is we have provided a two-year grant to the National Law School to set up a program uh, to study the performance of regulators in India, understand what are the best practices, etc. Because going back to your fundamental question of uh, SDG 16 and the nature of institutions, I think developing countries are moving towards what one might call from a centrally planned economy to a regulatory economy. Uh, and we are setting up more and more regulators starting 1991. I think they have really benefited India in some spaces, but there's much to be desired. Uh, and that's the gap we want to address. Got it. Thank you. Um, so I will go back to Sachin. Um, and um, from your vantage point, Sachin, for anybody who is trying to get into this space, what are large open spaces of innovation that you see? What are areas that you want new people, new blood to come in and, and take charge of? Uh, that's a great question. So, you know, before I answer that, I want to just address one binary that I realize that sometimes we get stuck in. We sometimes people come to us and say, you know what, you are doing so much work with um, citizen and community innovators, basically non-state, right? Uh, but but can you really make any change uh, without the state involvement? Yeah. And I think that it's so interesting, but our experience has been when you develop robust ecosystems of innovation, non-state innovation, you get to collaborate with the state in a different way. So it's a little bit like saying that you could take the approach that you're knocking on the door of the state and you're kind of saying, uh, you know what, here's a white paper. <laughs> you know, here's another white paper. You didn't read my first white paper, here's second white paper. Okay, third one is better, it's better designed. Uh, versus just doing work that models how things can be and becoming so, and letting it be so infectious and so norm setting that ultimately uh, the bright spots in the state, basically uh, people in the state and the state has several, whether it's judiciary or the government who are change minded, they want to be a part of that or they're already subliminally a part of that. So it's, it's a binary, it's a false binary that sometimes, you know, uh, you know, you take this route, you can't, you know, you have to be up in Delhi, you know, doing this, I'm not saying that there is no merit to that, but often it is uh, too blanket to say that, you know, uh, you have to, so the, so we would always want to invest in the human uh, institutions, you know, in making sure that, because that's, there's no win. There's, we, we, we insulate ourselves from, uh, you know, over dependence on some particular state change. You know? mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, I, I mentioned that, but I just thought to clarify that because. Yeah, interesting point, uh, because when you were talking about uh, these alternate ideas a lot of them the way i see it is they're they're actually bolstering or they're pro providing support to what uh, the usual law and justice uh, um, system has been in the country so it's not that they're they're creating parallel systems they're actually basically either reducing the burden on the on the law and justice system or they're bolstering it in ways which weren't possible earlier Hundred percent, and you see the recognition of that uh, with the top leaders in judiciary or government, right? If you look at, for instance, judiciary, Justice Chandrachud has repeatedly spoken about justice not being a place but being a service. Mm. You know, the shift from seeing justice as a place to justice as a service, which is a big shift, right? Like because there's a sort of a sense of uh, it's a special place you come to, you know, the courts. So, and then they've actively talked about how do you build institutions and architecture that enables informal players to support the system, mm -hmm. which is a big thing. Similarly, if you look at some of the work of the Niti Aayog, 
it has been actively in support of online dispute resolution. Mm. Uh, but why? Because everyone recognizes that most disputes should not be coming to the courts. Mm. How is a matter, a commercial matter, Priya, between you and me worth uh, two lakhs contesting for time with a bail petition or a, uh, somebody, I mean, these they are different matters, of course, but like how are these things you can you can't put them on the same page, yeah. right? So we need to. So I think that you're absolutely right. They strengthen systems. We need to see them seamlessly, and um, so that's that's why I mean that's just saying that that's why we are so gung ho on for remaining focused on the citizen-led innovation. Mm-hmm. To come to your question about areas of uh, before you answer yeah. that, I will yeah. just let the attendees know that if they want to ask any questions please feel free to write in the q a or in the chat box and we will take up some of these uh, hopefully we will have time to take up at least two three questions and please go a step further please share your ideas don't just ideas. knock on the door <laughs> don't just knock on the door there is me there is sachin there is shubhashi we are all we are all on the hunt for ideas so please yeah. share your ideas absolutely so to your the simple answer is almost every space right like we need more innovators in every space uh, but uh, just to 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 give some more shape to that um i think uh, like if you look at a lot of these areas like for instance access to government entitlements um uh, first level legal services that is basically when somebody needs a situation diagnosed something is happening like a helpline kind of situation legal representation disputes if you look at the entire gamut priya you realize that um you that essentially you need as a diversity of ideas diversity of solutions addressing all these different things i think what would be great to see more is coalitions sharing data developing collective strategies i think that would be great to see so i think it's one way to look at it is to say which are the areas where we don't see enough ideas and and i want one little flag i want to say is it's really cool you know in 2018 we did the agami prize uh, for the first time and we didn't see really innovative work in prisons at the scale with the prisons of the police at the scale at which we wanted there were definitely a few innovative projects no doubt but we felt that the, the, the lot of other sectors were racing ahead and and prisons and police we weren't seeing really creative work being done uh, but that has changed this year mm-hmm. so now we are seeing consistently creative work across every domain we'd like to see more of it we'd like to see more and more young people doing it um i think to re 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 emphasize my point we'd like to see initiatives that provide the connecting public goods architecture systems that allow people to be much more effective than they are i think we all saw in covid uh, the the struggle to say where is who is the immigrant where is the immigrant where where is the migrant like we didn't have the mechanisms to share that data we didn't have the mechanisms to respond more smartly so i think that we need we need the cross cutting and that's why again back to organizations like ashoka finding the architect entrepreneurs people who are who are willing to build these ideas that empower not just a single initiative but empower multiple initiatives i think we'd like to see more of those finally we'd also like to see more ideas leveraging the power of law schools and law students mm. there are so many law schools and law students in the country and they always talk about the quality of education not being good enough how about spending 3 to 5 years just being in legal service we'd like to see innovative models that leverage that okay okay thank you so much on this uh, shubhashish as uh, omidya uh, has funded organizations which are both bolstering the reform um, systems as well as focusing on digital identities so from your vantage point what are the kind of ideas or or uh, uh, ideators that you want to invest in yeah we've i think we see three broad areas uh, which require work and we see three broad enablers for that work to happen so three broad areas of work firstly is that for institutions to be healthy and accountable you need an informed citizen group 
Uh, and therefore, especially on some of the areas we work in, like data privacy, et cetera, I think we really need to up the game on informing citizens what it is, why is it important, what can they do about it. Yeah. I think the same is going to be true for many, many other things, including some of the other topics that we've discussed today. So that's one. Secondly, just rethinking the way institutions and individuals interact and the power dynamic between them and the efficiency and the methods of communication is extremely important. So in a way, what uh, Sachin said about uh, Justice Chandrachur's comments on uh, law being uh, or the legal being a service rather than a place, uh, I think the same mindset needs to go to other interactions between the state and the citizen as well. So at least how we think about it is there's so many touch points that all of us have with governments and institutions on a day by day basis. How do we start reimagining each of them? How do we start reimagining service delivery? How do we start reimagining justice? How do we uh, start reimagining healthcare? So all those touch points, I think are ripe for disruption because in the digital world, we can't have an 18th or a 19th century government. Uh, and finally, the third thing is, how do you enable individuals to have greater agency over their lives, right? I think we've uh, certainly been in a, a position where individuals have been dependent on institutions for a long time, uh, and that has benefits when you trust the institutions, but at the same time, it kind of de disempowers individuals in a certain way. Uh, so in, for example, in the space of digital identity and data privacy, we, I think, how do you enable individuals to have greater control over their data? Uh, so that they can withdraw their consent, they can uh, delete, get their data deleted, they can use their own data for their own benefit. Uh, I think all of these become important questions and there's a lot of innovation happening. Right? So these are the three big areas that we see. Uh, to make that happen, uh, there are layers of three enablers. Firstly, uh, around technology. I think technology is going to fundamentally disrupt all three of these, how we tell people about information, how they interact with institutions, how they control their uh, data, right? All of that gets uh, disrupted by technology. Uh, so we are certainly looking for uh, technologies both in the for-profit and the not-for-profit space and open source, et cetera, that make all of those three things happen. Uh, the second is data and insights. Uh, that on a bunch of these things, I don't think enough data is available today, yeah. right? Uh, the reason we started funding the state of Aadhaar surveys was because we realized that nobody is doing large scale surveys on Aadhaar and this is literally the most important thing that has probably happened in GovTech in the last 10 years and we don't have enough data. Uh, so that is why we funded and we continue to believe both in surveys, legal research, behavioral experiments, a lot more research needs to happen on each of these elements. Mm -hmm. uh, and the final thing I would say is civil society. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think civil society has an incredibly important voice here, both from the perspective of representing underrepresented groups, uh, as well as holding a certain discourse on some of these things, right? So um, I think there's an opportunity for civil society. Uh, they're already doing a great job. There's a, there's opportunity for them to do even an even better job. There's an opportunity for funders to support more civil society organizations, more grassroots organizations, more think tanks. So all in all, those are the three uh, you know, opportunities for innovation we see and the three enablers. Got it. Okay. Actually, both of you talked, use this word um, often and maybe if I can ask you to give examples and I think some, somebody in the, in the chat also mentioned is on collaboration. And that is a word that I keep hearing everywhere that there should be more collaborations. Maybe what would be interesting is you, if you can sh uh, talk about some examples of good collaborations that you've seen in the space. Uh, you want to go, Subhashish? Sure, happy to do that. Um, so, um, look, I think uh, collaboration doesn't happen either because things are incentivized in a certain way uh, or people often don't see the value for collaboration. And I think to that extent, uh, the role uh, that I've seen work very well is if you essentially subsidize the initial cost of collaboration that organizations undergo, and I think that's where philanthropies uh, can come in pretty effectively, then if they see value, they will do it. If they don't, they won't, right? And it shouldn't be forced collaboration in yeah. any way, just because the donor or whatever is asking for it, you must do it. Uh, one of the best examples of collaboration that uh, I have seen in uh, my area of work is something called the data governance network. Mm -hmm. We have four think tanks with very, very different points of view. Uh, someone's coming in with a very feminist research, someone's coming in uh, with a very economic centric uh, government led model of data governance and all of them come together and have uh, write papers and have a lot of discussions about what should the data economy look like and I think they really benefit uh, from each other's perspective. So I think what's important from uh, for collaboration to happen uh, is that initially I think it's going to be a bit, you know, everyone's going to show up and be like, you know, why am I here? What's in it for me? 
Uh, and I think you just have to go through that initial pain uh, and eventually more, at least our experience uh, in the philanthropic space has been most people eventually start seeing value. So I think you need to create those forums and you need to just be very disciplined about showing up at those forums. Mm -hmm. uh, and as conversations happen, I think collaborations are a very natural outcome. Yeah. Just to build on that, I think, um, you know, a collaboration gets a bad name because uh, I think sometimes this effort to uh, say both of you should work together, it doesn't go anywhere because, you know, what happens is that it's hard enough to build, build something. Once you form a mental model of this is what you're building and working towards, it's hard now somebody comes and says, and by the way, in addition to doing this, do this mm. uh, and, and do this with that person. Now it seems obvious because you'll say, but no, 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 it's for the benefit of you. It's, if you do this, you'll be more impactful. But sometimes entrepreneurs can get locked into a mental model of, of doing something and it's hard to shift their way of working, shift their energies. I think in the law and justice space, we're quite fortunate actually. We're seeing quite a lot of collaboration, you know, um, pretty much I mentioned, uh, of course, uh, Pariche, uh, which is the network of law, school, law schools, which is looking at how to represent the NR, NRC exclusions. Hmm. Uh, but there, is, there are actually lots of really good examples of people sharing um, resources. Uh, recently, the uh, state legal services authorities collaborated with some ODR platforms to do the Lok Adalats fully online. So, you know, it is happening quite a bit. I think that uh, a couple of things that come to my mind one, collaborating towards a piece that could then make your own work grow much more, that public good collaboration, I think is an important area. I'll give you an example of that. For instance, in the legal space, a lot of future solutions depend upon legal data. If you have to create a really compelling solution that tells you Priya, that, that Priya's uh, property is free of any legal title issues. Uh, right now, Priya has to get a 10 days legal, some lawyer has to do some work and check, do your title verification, go to some office somewhere. But you know, there are solutions out there like Teal and, and uh, Landright that can do this in hours now because they've integrated all that data. They've scanned, it's painstaking work because some of it is written in Canada and some of it is, is graphical. So the point I'm making is that that data can enable a range of other solutions, translations of legal information, legal, basic legal literacy, Q&A, asking basic questions, saying, do I have a right to do this? Um, even suggesting resolution of disputes. I mean, there's no limit because I think it's a kind of an obvious statement that data is that one resource that can enable the next generation of solutions, right? And this data comes from a lot of different sources. It can be public data, but as Subhashi said, institutions, private institutions are holding a lot of their data, enterprises are holding a lot of their data. So who's going to build that cat? Who's going to create the public good for data reflected together? <laughs> you know, so I think the place for a recognizing B, for organizations that do this and do this well, enabling this kind of architecture. I want to say that uh, the point I'm trying to... Uh, hello, uh, Priya, did you lose yeah. me? No, we, we can hear you. You're My connection got a little patchy. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. The, sh the short point is that there are these opportunities, there is direct collaboration one to one, but there is this collective action where you collaborate to create something that can benefit the sector as a whole. Um, and there's also a collaboration to push through a critical policy change or push through um, a greater uh, kind of a culture of uh, collaboration in a certain sector. So I think it's question of, for uh, from Agami's vantage point, we really focus on the sector rather than pushing you know, one organization to collaborate with the other. We look at where is there an opportunity for something that can be a collaboratively created public good, or we also look at how can we collaboratively uh, redefine the policy landscape or redefine the um, the standards that people are that hold themselves to so i i think that that's where i'm i feel like once you set that common goal priya uh, then things happen in a different way as opposed to saying hey both of you should do something together you know? so uh, so i think as enablers we do definitely play a role in 
in figuring out different parts of the system that can work together. But uh, for a larger uh, set of organizations that work in the space, at least from my experience, I'm seeing that there are a lot, for example, a lot of people building open source products. And at the same time, when you go and talk to a lot of nonprofits, everybody says, hey, I need this tech solution and I will go out and build that tech solution. Because a lot of times this awareness of what is out there in the market is also missing. And that was one of the uh, big reasons when we started thinking about, hey, can I create at least have a common space where I know who all exist in the space? I know uh, what are the different types of solutions that work. I know what are the different types of solutions people have been working on so that I can then concentrate on solution which is upstream or solution which is downstream and not just that particular solution. So, um, uh, so, so that's sort of where our, our thought process was when we started mapping out this SDG, especially starting with SDG 16 was to say, how do I know who all are there in the space and who can help me? Uh, before you, I mean, that's that's probably what I see as the first step of before I do collaboration is where I'm, I'm starting to understand uh, who is it or what uh, uh, what things exist in my market. Um, so um, so before, so I think um, for both of you, thank you so much for spending so much time on this. And I know there are a couple of questions that came. If you can spend maybe another five minutes to answer one or two of the questions. This one specifically for Shubhashish on uh, how is uh, Omidya Network seeing its role in bridging this trust gap between government and civil society organizations. And I think very important point, especially in the COVID times, we've seen that a lot of the trust gap in some areas has increased quite a bit and in some areas maybe it has filled a little bit. Yeah, I completely agree with you Priya. I think we're living in such difficult times uh, and we're living in such uncertain times and dealing with such ambiguities uh, that I think trust deficit uh, is quite natural to expect. And the way we at least look at kind of digital societies is it's a triangle, it's individuals, uh, there's uh, government and there's corporations and there's probably a trust deficit uh, that always exists uh, and I think the challenge for us is how do you minimize it um, and at least I think there are two key elements to minimizing these kind of trust deficit one is transparency right transparency is the antidote to everything I think you have to be uh, extremely transparent about uh, everything ranging from your financial information your sources of funding uh, your uh, why you are doing certain things and you have to communicate that very proactively uh, as someone uh, one of our grantees told me and i found that quote very nice it's not what you say but it's how you say that becomes more important and create that trust deficit at the same time i think that transparency is also equal equally important from the government side right for the government to come out and say look i've built for example i've built rog setu i'm willing to put its code out in the in open source so people can come see it uh, and similarly, uh, I have uh, rolled out Aadhaar. I'm willing to put out the data on who's getting excluded, et cetera, and hold a mirror. And I think that transparency from both sides is extremely important. Uh, and that is something certainly we advocate both for civil society organizations and for government that they should be more transparent. And then the second is to create forums for dialogue. Uh, because the less you talk to each other, the more suspicious you become. Uh, and I think that's true for any two stakeholders. And I think for therefore for the government to open its door uh, and I think it will be valuable for the government because, again, going back to the area I know well, data privacy is such an uncertain space that the government will benefit from the perspectives of civil society. Sometimes civil society will be right, sometimes they will be wrong, but whatever it is, just hearing all those perspectives will be useful for the government. Uh, and similarly for civil society as well to say that, look, at the end of the day, there are people sitting in government and it's not some monolithic uh, thing out there. There are different departments, there are different people. Uh, Sachin had initially spoken about, you know, the change maker might be lying somewhere there, right? And uh, to treat, uh, to open dialogue with them as individuals, as institutions, etc., will be extremely important. So, so in terms of doing that, uh, I think trust and dialogue are extremely important, and we certainly encourage uh, it from both sides because I think that helps us create uh, a meaningful life for every Indian. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I think there is one very interesting question that somebody asked is that we're giving most of our time to law and justice and peace gets a back seat. Won't working on peace be the way to work through roots? And I thought it was very interesting because I, I don't think when I'm talking to both of you, as well as looking at some of the other organizations that we've worked with, 
I feel like by bolstering some of the systems, we're actually working on peace and not so much on remedial action of law and justice, but uh, how not to put in more and more stress on law and justice. But I would love to hear both of you. Uh, what do you think about that? Maybe I can take a crack at it. I think that um, you know it's really well said when you kind of go below below things uh, to issues like trust and peace and uh, fundamental issues of fairness. You know, like the human values. I think that uh, what is really interesting is when you when you look at community based models and when you're really looking at citizen innovation that's they have the potential to integrate those things mm. you know they have the potential to really address it at the human level saying look this has happened how are you going to what do you want what is going to they have the ability to add layers and layers of humanity to the solution in a way that you can't do at a national level uh, you know that easily right so i think that that is the reason why we need a right to your first question at the beginning, we need a very diverse variety of, we need to support innovation because that innovation can be humane. It can be really addressing core issues instead of thinking. For instance, if you talk about the issue of, say, women uh, who, who lose their husbands and then get deprived, turned out of the house and deprived of their property rights, who best knows the, to deal with this legally, emotionally, materially, but other women? Like, yeah. how are you going to, what does that model look like? You know, <laughs> so is, is it, so I think that first we need to, that's why it's very important to invest in citizen and community driven justice innovation because it gets to the fundamentals, you know, that's, that's one aspect. The second thing is, you're absolutely right. Uh, we, we are, we are not, I, th I think now this is not about law and justice only, like this is pulling it back we need to do greater work as human beings, right? We need, we need models that are helping all of us engage much more deeply, you know? Um, I think that there is a, like, there is a, like when we talk, when, when you look at creative models to scale uh, contemplation, a deep dialogue, um, reconciliation, elevate, you know, even just, tools to work on your own consciousness. <laughs> you know, you can't say, we, we, we get KG, but they go to the heart of things. How do you really heal? Mm. Can you heal only cognitively? You know, uh, so my point is that if you want to talk about the really meaningful changes, then uh, we cannot be, uh, we cannot ignore that you need to get into the deep human issues of healing and elevating our consciousness so therefore, there is a very strong place for faith. There's a strong place for spirituality. And of course, excluding that deep dialogue engagement, there's a place for that. Uh, because there are these fissures in our society and purely understanding them from an intellectual point of view uh, and saying, oh, I know it now. Mm -hmm. No, you have to elevate your leadership to another level. So therefore, the, in conclusion, the point I'd like to make is, what does the justice entrepreneur, for that matter, any social entrepreneur of the future or the change maker of the future looks like? I think you cannot separate from that person deep commitment to personal well being. Yeah, thanks. Shibashi, would you like to add something? I think Sachin put it very beautifully, uh, and I don't have too much to add. Uh, the only thing I would say is that as you think about peace, um, one aspect of it is absence of violence, uh, but I think one aspect of it is also individual agency, right? Sometimes you internalize the threat of violence so much that you start behaving fundamentally differently. And while at the surface it might seem peaceful, uh, yeah. but I think it is a suppression of people through the threat of violence uh, in a certain way, which also is not something we should be doing. And therefore, this question of individual agency and individual autonomy and their ability to do whatever they want to do without fear uh, of that that violence, I think is an extremely important one. Uh, so as we think about peace, I think I'd love for all of us to also think about how do we enable people to do what they want to do uh, relatively freely. What that means in an economic life, right? You go ahead and you start a business. Some very often and most of the times you will fail, uh, but you should not have such 
uh, pernicious repercussions emanating from it that it just you know scares you from ever having to start up on your own. I think that agents that aspect of individual agency is important. And similarly, uh, in social life, for you to be able to say what you want to say without having those kind of repercussions and freedom of expression, etc., become extremely important. Uh, so I would certainly encourage all of us to add that uh, to when we talk about peace. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. And just one thing Priya will say is that there are a few organizations trying to peel this back and go to the core of issues, conflict. You know, I can think of Uncommon Ground, Bolti Band. There are people who are trying to pull back and get to the fundamentals. Uh, and then there are also people who are at the fundamentals of, you know, kind of community and consciousness and leadership. So there are people working at different levels. I think it comes back to the question of are we connecting the dots in a powerful yeah. way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Actually, um, that that brings me towards the end of what I wanted to say um, at the end of this session is that people everywhere in the world need to feel safe in their everyday lives, irrespective of their caste and creed and ethnicity, sexual orientation, faith. And that will be the first or the biggest driver to help them build better lives for themselves. And all of us in our own ways are trying to build solutions that can help uh, or by supporting organizations that work on building this equitable society. Um, uh, so thank you so much, both of you. Uh, and um, and we really missed Ashif, but I'm hoping that uh, that we will get to connect with him at, at a later point in time. And thank you both of you for spending so much time on this. And thank you to all the attendees for spending time this late in the night in India. Um, there is a couple of things that we would love to get your help on. Uh, we will, uh, we have shared a link to this, um, uh, this study that we have done, this landscape that we've created. Uh, we will also send you a detail on email with, uh, with this uh, landscape and some of the views that were shared today. Uh, do send us the names of organizations that you would like to see in this landscape. Uh, do send us ideas on how can we make this landscape more useful uh, for all of you. And um, thank you so much again for joining us. And um, good evening, everybody. Bye. Thank, thank you, Priya. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.